Hello, I'm Brett Moss, and you're watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. Our guest today is Rosalind Russell. Rosalind is an ordained minister, an entrepreneur, and the founder and director of the nonprofit R Star Foundation. She's a graduate of Santa Anita Church Ministerial School in Arcadia, California. Rosalind lives in Laguna Beach. Rosalind Russell, welcome back to The Defining Moment. It's really a pleasure for me to welcome you back to our studio today. And it's a pleasure to be back here, even with my two pets. Well, thanks for bringing your cats. Our topic today is Pets as Caregivers. And I'd like to begin by giving you a chance to share with our viewers a defining moment which opened your eyes to the value of cats as caregivers. It'd be my pleasure. Several years ago, about five and a half years ago, my father was in the process of dying from Parkinson's. And it was the worst experience for me to have to go and visit with him. And yet, it's my father. And I wanted to go, but it was so challenging. Now this cat, Star Kitty, Star Kitty Russell to be exact, was very good about going in the car. And I had rescued her years before. And so I thought, I'm just taking this cat because I need her companionship because it's so difficult and I really, really would like to visit with my dad and I need comfort. And this actually brought a great deal of information to me because when other people say to me, my mother's dying or something is happening, and I go, well, I don't want to go visit. I truly understand because I didn't want to go see my father because it was just too awful to see him in a bed not moving and definitely never going to get better. So Star Kitty trucked up there with me for an hour's drive just to get there. I take her on in and she had her uh, figure eight uh, collar on so that way she couldn't get away. My family, we've always had cats in the family or you know some kind of a pet and dogs. But my father was in a room that was small and pretty ugly and he wasn't getting anything live action-wise going on. And I bring in Star Kitty for me, and I say, Dad, would you like me to put Star Kitty on your, on your lap, on your chest? And he kind of made the motion that he was capable of doing at that time. And I put her down there. Now, for those of you that might know a little bit about uh, Parkinson's, it's a disease that the people will have a control thing. And so when he locked in and he put his hands right on her figure eight collar, I don't have it on her right now because she's quite calm and easy, but uh, he held on to that cat, this cat, for two hours, of which amazed me. I did not know that my cat could do this. And on the spot, I recognized as we left that the cat had given comfort to my dad because he would be petting her, and I could see that he was softer in how it was that he felt. And, you know, because it's not a comfortable thing to be in that process of dying with any disease. Of course not, yeah. So that was how my PER ministry was birthed. And it is, has become one of the, my things that I get to do within my scope of ministry. So as soon as I returned to my car with Star Kitty, I called up a friend who had mentioned she takes her dog to the South Coast Medical Hospital and visits with patients. So I had tried many times, by the way, to get into this hospital, but it was a direct contact that got me in there. So off we went, and every month we would go in and visit with the different people. I'm sure you have some other testimonies of the ways in which cats and pets are used uh, for therapy. Please share those with us. I took on that job at the South Coast Hospital, and mind you, I say job, but it was my gift to my community. And uh, there was, as I was on the elevator going to the fifth floor where I would be working in that ward, a, a family grabbed me when they saw my cat. And they said, you have to go see Randy. And I'm thinking, no, I'm supposed to go see the person in charge of this. And so I checked in first, but they didn't let go of me. And I immediately went in to see Randy. Interestingly enough, Randy was actually from my own community. and. So there he was, and he had a helmet on his head. And I took in Star Kitty, and I introduced myself first and said, Hi, Randy. I'm Rosalind, and I brought my kitty, Star Kitty. I understand that you really like cats. And there was a picture of his own cat, a white Persian. I go on into you know, some more uh, dialogue with, with Randy, and his family was so thrilled. They stood back, and I picked up Randy's hand. This man could not move. 
His eyes were even in different places at the same time. And so I picked up his hand and I petted his hand and stroked across the cat. So every other week when I went in to visit the different many patients in that particular ward, I'd go in and I did the same routine with Randy. Hi Randy, I'm back here to visit with you. I hope that your week has gone well. And Star Kitty and I are here to visit with you. And I'd put her down. Well, a few months after going in, and certainly Randy wasn't capable of responding. I'm, you know, a helmet on his head. The first time I saw him without a helmet on his head, it was because half of his head wasn't there. Oh my Lord. He had been severely beaten, which was the trauma that got him in the position that he was. I was in there and I was telling him, Randy, I'm coming into the room and I'm gonna put Star Kitty on. And before I got her completely set down on his chest, he had his hand coming up and coming over and stroking her on his own. Now, I've heard that our brains redevelop, mm -hmm. but I have never seen it. I mean, I read about it, but it was right there. It was so amazing to me. Mm -hmm. I couldn't wait to run out and get the nurses. I couldn't leave the cat because that's not what you do. Eventually, a nurse actually came in and I said, oh, you've got to get the head nurse in here and the others. This is amazing. Look at what Randy's doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, essentially he was a vegetable in his bed, but mm -hmm. he wasn't. We should never underestimate that the power of a human as long as we're breathing mm -hmm. we're understanding there are things going on mm. so that was one of my very personal very direct communications about what par you know therapy can do mm -hmm. it does help in his case in randy's case it helped to develop his brain into more function mm -hmm. another experience that i can give you with directly relating to an animal and therapy is the salon that i go to in long beach has a dog there and it's for therapy for not only the clients coming in but the dog actually performs therapy and goes and visits with people as well in some guest homes and rest homes and my gift to the dog is I take the dog for a walk in Naples area and it's a charming dog that I even had part in rescuing so I'm especially attached to it but that dog is so good that when I've taken Star Kitty with me the dog leaves the cat alone and the cat leaves the dog alone and they mm -hmm. you know therefore get along as far as I'm concerned mm -hmm. but the things that I've seen with what happens with the dog being there in the salon people come in and 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 they come over and they pet the dog they bring treats for the dog they're happy to see the dog because why that dog offers as all animals do unconditional love and a greeting that tells you you are important so it's a very exciting kind of a thing that when you get to see this in action, I'll be sitting in my chair looking just terrible, and in come people, and they're all so happy to see Cassie the dog. It's a wonderful thing. And the other thing that I have seen is another family in my neighborhood, and they have a child that has uh, seizures frequently, and they have a dog that can sense by smell the hormones that take place preceding an epileptic fit. This is saving that child's life, certainly damage to him. So yes, I've seen many different things and I've heard of many more. Yeah, okay, very, very interesting. Now this cat that I'm holding, uh, his name is Zimba Star. And you know, he's in this uh, <coughs> unknown environment of, the, of our studio. Obviously a lot of distractions uh, and hot lights and everything, but he's actually purring and very comfortable and he's just known me you know a matter of minutes so it's really amazing how quickly a relationship can develop between pets and human beings if those pets are have the kind of disposition to to be comfortable around strangers well it is true that they have to have a disposition to be you know a kind cat they're cats that are just too uh, grumpy uh -huh. And so that wouldn't be a good cat, but I, I do work with my animals. And when I rescued this cat several months ago, I noted what a sweetness he had about him. And I knew that he would be able to do the same work that Star Kitty does in even a different way. He's mm. more docile mm. than she is. And he really doesn't mind. Mm. He's quite content. Mm -hmm. And when he was the first time in the car, I thought, oh, he'll be just on the ceiling and running around and shredding things. And absolutely he wasn't. He was quite mm. content. Hmm. And knowing that he's getting scratched under his throat and he's happy, I know that he likes sitting with you. <laughs> okay, thank you. 
No, what other information have you come across about the ways in which pets are used uh, for health and therapy of human beings? Well, as I already mentioned, they're used a great deal for epileptic seizures, for heart attacks that they're beginning to, our doctors are beginning to understand that hormones have a smell and animals, they have this amazing ability to smell things. Yeah. And I think recently we even saw on the news that there was a cat that impending death, the cat would go and sit with that person. Imagine the comfort that would be for the person in that process of transition. You know, what a marvelous gift. But their knowing of what's going on is amazing. And throughout history, we've been told that animals are dumb. I think that in truth, we're going to have to come around to the idea that we have not learned their language. They communicate, but we don't know how to write it down. And because they don't write, we think they're stupid, which of course they're absolutely not. I watched Lassie all my life. Lassie knew everything going on and always came in at the right moment to save whatever the situation was. So in that sense, I've always known about the therapeutic effects of, of animals. We're also seeing horses. You know, we've got children that have cerebral palsy and others that have been wise enough to say, let's put that child on there carefully and safely and give them an experience of running around with a horse. And certainly with my own horseback riding, I say, hello, horse, and that horse just trots right on up to me. Of course, I do have an apple for it. There, there's a real companionship that, that, that's yeah. created almost instantaneously. They're very quick to give their love. They're mm -hmm. unlike us in that sense. And I think that that may be part of the attraction um, of the fillingness that an animal can do when we take them out to visit with people. They know that that animal will like them. They're not concerned a bit. And even if the animal didn't like them, they like them because mm. they're soft. And, you know, blood pressure is brought down. Some of the studies show blood pressure is actually brought down. That's right, Star Kitty, you're helping. I don't have high blood pressure, <laughs> but I pet them a lot. So it is one of the therapies that doctors are beginning to say, do you have an animal? Uh -huh. Well, if you do, please pet your animal a lot. Mm. What an amazing thing this would be for the tonnage of animals that irresponsible people you know, make by dumping their animals, they're too old, they dump them, or they don't like its behavior, or they don't want fur, or it'll claw their leather. Mm -hmm. So they dump the animals out, and these animals later on get you know, killed or they don't live good lives. Right. And people could rescue them for the purpose of therapy. Animals don't live a very long time, mm -hmm. but they sure give a lot for the time that they live. Sure, absolutely. And so what are some of the situations which are most suitable for the benefits of pet therapy? I think that our rest homes, our con convalescent homes, Certainly people that are shut-ins, and, and we're talking shut-ins that could be within a hospital where they can't leave that premise or within a home itself. I do a lot of in-home visits with my cats locally. Mm -hmm. But children that have cancer, I mean, these are very live little beings and yeah. they're in tragic situations. They thrill to having not only visitors, but to having pets that come in and give them service by being there. These kids like, oh, they sometimes the children will bury their heads into an animal because it feels good, mm -hmm. but because for that one moment they can feel everything is okay and mm. that they are going to resolve. And when you have that feeling, you're putting out into your body endorphins. What do endorphins do? They do healing. Mm -hmm. They bring up the immune system. Mm -hmm. So we could say these are like acidophilus bacteria. <laughs> They're out there bringing up the immune system. Okay, great. How do you envision hospitals and rest homes instituting programs that would be able to expand the use of pets for, for therapy? Well, actually, Brett, there are a lot of uh, institutions that currently do have animals living there as mascots, for one. And, and it used to be where you might see fish or a bird, but now the convalescent homes are beginning to understand, hey, these animals are doing more. They make the person want to leave their room come on out to breakfast, for instance, because then they're going to see whatever, you know, animal they have. And I see both cats and dogs, you know, in different places, hospice care as well. So it's becoming understood. Now, there are those that run these places that don't like animals. Many people haven't been brought up with an animal around them. And so they think that they might be dirty or uh, mean or, you know, there would be concern. But the truth is, is that a healthy animal isn't going to contribute to 
non-health for the average individual, for most people. You know, my animals are uh, not allergic, meaning they're not allergic to people, that's for sure. But aside from that, they also don't have the problems that are produced for some people that have allergies because I keep them allergenically free. And that's just simply by a great deal of grooming and proper eating and keeping them in good health so they don't have to you know be a problem and certainly there's always the concern of fur I mean it gets in your nose we've already seen that going on with both of us but that's a minor minor detail and vacuums are very good for getting rid of that kind of thing but I do see that more and more the therapeutic value and understanding of animals will continue and therefore expand and I believe that this will be a good way for rescued animals to be rescued to be in service Okay, great. Um, is there some kind of certification process necessary in order to be able to introduce pets to hospitals, rest homes, clinics? For some, yes. Not all different, all different places have their own different uh, regulations and that. When I was at the South Coast Hospital, I certainly had to have a, a clean bill of health for this animal. And because I do work in uh, recovery homes and some other places, I also have my TB tests. So not only is Star Kitty up to standards, but so am I to do public service, mm -hmm. which is a thir you know, certainly a consideration mm -hmm. to have. The certifications for dogs, you'll often see a dog that's in training and they'll have a little vest on them indicating what they're doing. And there are many different kinds of training for, for dogs. As for cats, I haven't heard of any particular training. Mm -hmm. People tend to think of them as free spirits. And that's because you can't make them you know, do their tricks. Star Kitty does tricks. But I doubt that right now I could get her to do anything other than what she is currently doing. <laughs> okay. But she doesn't get her food unless she sits up. And that's just because I figure, you know, I'm feeding you do something. It makes me excited to get up and work for you. Uh -huh. Now, one thing I've picked up through speaking with you is you don't simply drop off the pets at the hospital or convalescent homes. You're always there accompanying them. Now, I think that's very important for people to take into consideration that these are not programs where you can just employ the pets without the human element there as well. So you, you need to supervise the visits. <clears throat> yes, that is true. I, when I go into the hospitals or whatever location I go, I am with the animal, one for the animal's security, not that anybody would harm either he or, or her, but rather so that I can manage them. And, and also, you know, as a minister, that's how I can also be in service as the human standing there. And each person that I visit, it's determined on a case basis. So some people that aren't able to talk and there's no interaction, I do go in and I visit with them for a period of time. And then with others that are able to interact, then I stay you know, longer. So it's always a determinant thing. And then I have uh, you know, restrictions on how much time I can donate to this because again it's a voluntary thing that I do as a part of my gift to the community. I, I do have a real strong belief that we're to give in many areas. And, and people shouldn't be put off by the fact that you're a minister and this is a ministry for you. It's something that potentially anybody who loves people and loves pets could do in the same way that you do it. Oh, you, absolutely. Don't have, you don't have to be a minister to do this. Oh no, absolutely not. It just happens that that's how I started you know, within it. No, the ministry is the animal going in and the ministry is also that aspect that you're giving your time and your life to go talk to somebody else that's not in a free position mm -hmm. to go about their life as perhaps they would prefer. Mm -hmm. So it's an absolute blessing. So many people have animals that they could take just to their friends that are in, in situations. It would be a great gift to them. Yeah. And if they can go beyond that and they can get their qualifications uh, understood and met, then they could go and be in service, you know, maybe once a month for an hour, maybe longer, depending on that individual's, you know, willingness. But mm -hmm. many people that are shutaways, shut-ins, are so terribly neglected for social interaction, for giving, you know, being given something, that a visit with a pet can be really beyond imagination and better than a bottle of pills. Uh -huh. In your experience, how receptive have rest homes and hospitals been to having pets on their premises? And what are the most common concerns and considerations that they have? Well, many places are very receptive to having animals. They have their own. And they'll have maybe a dog and a couple of cats. And they'll have fish 
they'll have canaries I see a lot of times and certainly parakeets uh, some of the homes actually allow people to have their own animal in their own apartment area but for those that don't have their own animal but would like to interact with one they can certainly come out and see what I call them as a mascot and then people come out and they visit with them they bring them their treats and it's quite enjoyable it's an add to retirement communities without question in my personal opinion and an animal doesn't require that much care so it doesn't take hours out of one's day for the gift that they give yeah and, and the concerns and considerations that, that usually prohibit their presence um, it would usually be a lack of understanding that allergies are manageable meaning the allergy producing toxins of a cat mm -hmm. so because I'm so always some people around. are allergic to cats so they're, right and so they're, they're, they're actually not allergic to a cat what but they're thought they think that they are because cats have dander but there are different cats that have different levels of dander and you can control it by their health by how you care for them uh, small solutions of water and vinegar combed on them daily breaks down the saliva which is what carries the uh, toxin to a human but not all humans are going to react to it most of us don't there it's a very slim part of our population that would be involved with having an allergy related to a cat or a dog because dogs also have dander mm -hmm. and cats by the way have become such a popular item because they're such easy animals to tend to that more and more we have uh, cats being purchased or rescued in our homes they now are number one for the domestic animal within our homes mm -hmm. over dogs and tell us, tell us a bit more about wh how your cats respond to, be, to being taken out on the road and introduced into you know, new environments, foreign to them. How, how, do, they, how do they accept that kind of uh, a role? Well, as you can see, they're very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they really don't like it. Once I get them into the car, if it's a, which it's usually a transportation thing, once they get in the car and they know where their cat box is and that I'm in there, they get used to it. And once in a while, they'll, they'll chatter, meow, 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 and then I just talk to them. I have a lot of strange conversations with my cats as we travel. They're pretty good. Then they're a little curious when we get to where we're going, and I usually hold them a little bit more and uh, squish them, as I like to say. Just hold them so that they're very secure. And Star Kitty doesn't obviously need any squishing right now. She's totally relaxed. There's, they're fine, but I do know I stress them. It is not something that is given to them. A dog is far easier to go in and do it. But for those that I'm going to tend, they like cats. So what do I do? Take them a dog? No, I don't have one to take them. But I take them the cat and I stress the cat out and I just say, Kitty, this is your gift. This is what you get to do. And it's a wonderful thing. Do they get special treats? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, they do. Would you like a special <laughs> okay. treat? And so they don't get these treats all of the time. They have to be doing their, their little working jobs. Uh -huh. And they get something, and it makes them very, very happy. Mm -hmm. Again, they give far more than it takes for us to manage them. They're really lovely. Mm. I can't imagine not having an animal, whether working or not, in my life. Mm. They're just such a sweet essence of God. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you mentioned that you have a portable litter box for your cats. Um, do you ever take that into the facilities that you visit? Is it ever necessary to do that? Um, usually not, because kitties, dogs, cats, they, they tend to eat and then they tend to go. It's not something that's urgent, but under stress that can change what's going on. It depends on how long I'm going to be visiting. Do I take a litter box with me every time I go with them? Yes, in the car. And so I'll show them, hey, here's the kitty box, and then I let them run around in the car with their leash tangling here and there and but usually they sit on my lap when I'm driving mm -hmm. so the kitty box is in there and they are very responsive to using it uh, never seems to be an issue they're very smart mm. okay great um, how do you envision the development of pet therapy in the future I think that more pets will be seen in our convalescing homes in the future in our hospice situations because the therapeutic value that can be read about there are stories and books of real life situations that have happened with people documentaries or uh, documentaries rather are everywhere doctors are understanding um, that the therapy of petting an animal is going to calm a person down 
It's going to make them feel good. A cat can be good, a dog can be good for transition time. I think that it truly will expand because they are such unconditional little lovers. You know, if anybody was interested in doing uh, some pet therapy on their own, I would suggest that, you know, you make sure your animal is, of course, veterinarianly cleared and that they're microchipped. It's a, you know, a very simple, inexpensive thing to do. For a cat, it would need to have a halter type of a harness on it and always with a leash. Now, we're in a confined area, so I don't care whether the cats get up and run, but I want to make sure that when I'm in my car, that that animal, should an accident happen, oh, please not, that they're going to be, you know, all right and secure too, and that they're not going to, if I open the door or the window to take a ticket out or something, that it's not going to be an issue of their running away because I have the leash. I carry them in a bag, as you saw me do uh, when I came in this mm -hmm. morning, and I will, you know, carry them back outside. So they're always contained, and I suggest that that be done because animals are still animals. They are not regulated to our human world, sure. and we need to consider, you know, what is that animals need. Rosalind, I can't thank you enough for bringing your cats in today and sharing with us your vision and your experience about using pets as caregivers. It's really been fascinating for me, and I can't thank you enough for being here today. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. And, and Star Kitty says, thanks. <laughs> okay. You've been watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. You can find us on the internet at www.definingmoment.tv. Thanks for watching and have a great day.